a pro career dating to 2002, Australian Kyle Noak boasts a versatile offensive game and one he hopes to impart upon his team of prospects. Today, Noak primarily trains with Greg Jackson and Mike Winklejohn in Albuquerque, New Mexico. But his path to mixed martial arts couldn't be more Australian in nature. Living in Albuquerque, I don't get a chance to swim much. Whenever I'm home, I, the first thing I do is try and get to the beach. Especially not growing up with the ocean close by, uh, moving up here at a young age, I think we were 17 when I first moved up, uh, you know, I fell in love with the beach straight away. Uh, even if it's winter, you know, I'm going for a swim. I don't get home as much as I'd like to see my family. It's just a big thing for me because we all grew up so close, you know, my brothers and my best friends. Being away all the time and being away from my family makes me want to work harder. It makes me want to make them proud of me and it makes me want to uh, push myself for them. <laughs> you, you could tell he was going to be an athlete from when we played junior football. He ex excelled at uh, rugby league and, matter of fact, anything he put his mind to. Making the transition to becoming a professional athlete and fighting in the UFC, you know, it, it was a long process for me. It wasn't something that I, I set out to do when I first started fighting. As I got better and better, I, I decided that, you know, I can make a career out of this. You see every pro athlete in the world, all the, the best of the best, they always concentrate 100% on their sport, you know. No one does it part-time becomes the best. For me, that was moving to the States and uh, pursuing my dream over there. Steve Irwin had a huge influence on my fighting career and my life in general. You know, he was a great guy to work with. You know, he loved the sport of mixed martial arts. I remember going for my job interview. The first thing Steve said to me was, right, you've got the job, now let's talk about fighting. Steve didn't really need a bodyguard, you know, he was a big guy. He was uh, six foot two and he's over 100 kilos most of the time, so he, he didn't need a bodyguard. Steve was basically just looking for another person to train with mixed martial arts. He built us a cage at the zoo so we could train every day out there. We used to do mixed martial arts sparring every Wednesday morning. Tuesday night he couldn't sleep a wink. He'd be down there in the gym with his hands all wrapped, gloves on, two o'clock in the morning, shadows box, and waiting for us to get there at, at seven o'clock. Without him, I wouldn't, there's no doubt I wouldn't be here where I am today. He paid for my trips when I first started going to the US. Just being around a guy that's so passionate about what he does, it just kind of rubbed off of you, off in you and, and made you want to work harder. Steve showed a lot of potential as a fighter. He was super strong. Whenever he got, held you down and took you down, he'd get on top of you and there's no way to get him off you. You know, I guess all those years of wrestling animals, crocodiles, or whatever. Yeah, you know, I was very upset when Steve uh, passed away. Um, I just left him two weeks prior. We'd been up north for six weeks catching crocodiles and doing research and putting satellite trackers on them. Um, you know, I, I, got, I got a call to have a fight in the States, so I started my camp in the States, started getting ready for a fight, and then um, I, got the, I got a call and got the news that Steve had passed, so uh, obviously I packed up all my stuff and, and, and flew back home to Australia to say goodbye to my friend. If he was still around today, I think he'd be the biggest supporter ever. What he used to come watch all my local fights uh, whenever I fought here in Australia. So um, I think definitely right, he'd be flying over and watching all the all my international fights as well now.